time around. We've discovered the elixir of healthy life in Oxford. Discovered. It's called knowledge. And it's consumed by learning, not out of a bottle. And I'm going to tell you about it and then tell you what we're doing about it. But now I'd like you to imagine you're 71 and you're sitting in uh, a bridge club or a bowls club or a mosque or a WI. Okay, just imagine. I, I'm going to give you the pitch for five or six minutes. Um, and our aim is for a thousand people in every million property to be able to give this pitch. So it's a, a, a training program to give it. Okay. Aging is not a problem. It caused a major problem in the late 90s. You need a bit of luck. It's not the cause of major problems. And it does affect your maximum level of ability, maximum pulse rate, for example. And it does affect resilience, your ability to bounce back if you've got uh, a trip or a stumble or a change in temperature. I've been giving this actually also to the 58 year olds in pre retirement. I'm planning to learn retirement, it's called Renaissance. So, we'll do that. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, there are four factors affecting us of which aging is one, and here are the three others I'm going to just go through. So, there's only two phases in life the phase of growth and development, <clears throat> a turning point, and then it's downhill all the way. <laughs> but don't despair. Because for most of us, the rate at which we go downhill is affected by these three other factors. The first of which is loss of fitness. And that's physical, cognitive, and emotional. And a fitness gap opens up, which gets wider from about, usually about 22 on. And that's not because of lifestyle. I'm banning the word lifestyle. It's an environmental problem. Professor Lieberman at Harvard says these are environmental problems. The genome we've inherited after hundreds of generations is suited to running about all the time and putting on fat quickly if any calories appear. It's a different environment. You know, if you're commuting from Vauxhall to Barking and sitting eight hours at a computer, you know, that's an environmental problem, it's not your lifestyle. So the fitness gap moves up. The good news is that at any age you can close the fitness gap, at any age you can drop a decade, okay? So fitness has got two features. One is loss of maximum ability. So I can't really tell who's fit and who's not fit. But if I asked you all to run a mile, I'd know much better. Some would not come back and I would know that. <laughs> because fitness is also loss of resilience. You see, that's the same as aging. That's why the medical profession have confused these things until very recently. So aging, loss of fitness, and disease. Now, when disease comes on, the best possible rate of decline accelerates. So I had a myocardial infarction 10 years ago, 11 years ago. So I lost a chunk of heart muscle. So I can't burn 100 yards now. But the fitness gap gets wider and faster. And it may be because of the loss of fitness, you drop the lower condition I call the line. And the line's the point where you can't get the toilet in time. And that's it, game over. <laughs> and why does the fitness gap get quite a faster? It's not because of disease, it's because of the well meaning intentions of others. The son comes to see you from Bradford or somewhere and how's it going, Mum? Oh, I'm struggling with the shops, Ocado, 52%, completely the wrong thing. The good news is that at any age, no matter how many conditions you've got, I've got about three or four conditions. Um, I've got heart disease, uh, polio in my right leg when I was seven. I've got a disease called CLEB. Anybody heard of CLEB? My GP hadn't heard of it either. It's called cotton like a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone in Glasgow had it, but it was brought up before the clean air. <laughs> so uh, it doesn't matter how many conditions you've got. But then we need to come on to think of these issues here. Deprivation affects too many people and is the major cause of decreased health span. And ageism affects us all. So we've got to fight it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's, um, that's what I'd say to you in the bridge club or the bowls club or the mosque 
of the Kubernetes on okay. He said, let's just think a little bit strategically now. So uh, what's our aim? Our aim is to increase health span. I don't actually meet many people who want to live to 118 or 108 or whatever. Maybe it would be different if it is different. And I'm not sure how the planet can cope with a whole lot of people living down there. Because it's them who's eating the food that the farmers are producing the, the carbon for. But for most people, it's compressing morbidity at the end of life. That's the key issue. And this is the big problem. This is the big problem. And getting bigger. So, what are we going to do? Uh, we have to do something urgently. Because not only does loss of resilience affect health span, it has a big impact on who cares. When you lose resilience, when something comes along like a chest infection, you're off legs, and the GP refers you to hospital. And this is the pattern at the top. You want to stay out of hospital as much as you can in the last year of life. So what we're doing is developing a system for living longer, better. And it's based partly on this principle here, but even more important is this principle here. Self-care is the most important type of health care. Self-care is the most important type of health care. Now, we need the NHS for diagnosis, for acute care, and for starting the right treatment. But after the right treatment started, you're on your own. So self-care is the most important for prevention and for living with long-term conditions. And body care is very important too. And uh, we're setting up, I'll come back to what we're doing about, about buddies. So here's, here's what I've had from the NHS in the last year about my drugs. And the next slide shows what I've had about diet, exercise, how I'm feeling in the last 11 years. <laughs> Not one. Well, and that's not because you know, they don't have a doctor or anything like that. I mean, it's just it. Not one word from the NHS. Okay, so let's let's get the NHS to focus on diagnosis, acute care, and um, starting the right treatment, giving the right drugs for your cancer or your Parkinson's or whatever. But after that, sunshine, you're on your own. <laughs> but you're not. So. What we're doing is moving from social prescribing to digital social prescribing. And we've set up, um, I always say I've got two ambitions in life. One is global domination of my ideas, and, and the other is getting people and doctor to work better together. And all around the world, people tell me which is the easier to <laughs> But we've actually got everyone in Oxford now, and Mike, Mike Reed, uh, our introducer, came up with the, the concept of a digital therapeutic community. Now, okay, only 75% of the over 70s are online at the moment. But the, if we focus on giving people who are online knowledge and support, then then he says you get on visiting people who are not online, because they are the ones with multiple problems. So we're, um, we're reducing digital prescriptions for activity. And I uh, say, I haven't had a single word from the NHS in 11 years, so I wrote my own. And this, oh. So the, my GP record knows my postcode, it knows my diagnosis, it knows my treatment. So this tells me lots of things here. Um, it tells me what's available. Um, there's there's um, Rambler's Health Walks in summertime in Jericho. Um, there's a gym nearby where one of the trainers has had heart disease. I can have uh, Exe Life, uh, I can be referred there for exercise, Exe Life. David and Louise, are you here? Louise is at, at the back. You see, this is more important than the human genome. <laughs> and Exe is an apple spin out that uses this. All right, not everyone's got this, and not everyone's got an eye watch or whatever, but the world is changing, and we can think about that. So this tells me, this is an activity prescription. And it, uh, it gives me a lot of information, both local and national, without the GP having to press the button. Because the GP may not know what's going on in Santa and Jericho because they're a local. I mean, the, the, old, the word is gone. And someone said, 
well, that's terribly long. But actually, my GP record has got the word for present written in it. So why didn't they give me the references? And the chap, Alan Naismith, with whom I'm working, yeah, I can give you references. If the word professor is there, we just start giving references. That's all we need. This can be done automatically. This is not AI or anything. This, this is just, I don't understand it, but it's just simple linking up. So, we started thinking, and this I'm working with Mike Reed here, um, about, uh, uh, about emotional, physical, and cognitive. And it's the emotional and cognitive that's at least as important as the physical. So here we are, this is the Goals of Health Service, which focuses on physical and emotional. But then Mike raised the issue. Mike, just put your hand up. Yeah. Mike says, well, that's okay for 60% of the population who will respond to something. The big challenge is the 40% who won't. So how do we get them in God involved in a community, a well-being community? We're not going to mention the word activity or exercise or health or aging or anything like that. We just got to reach these people who are stuck at home, not getting the bridge club or the bowls club, just bloody played out. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's up to us. We need a revolution, and the revolution is here. And just if I could. Uh, uh, just for a minute, just turn to your neighbour for one minute, for good one minute, turn to your neighbour for a minute and think what is the, imagine you're back at the bridge club or the bowls club, what's the takeaway message you're going to give to your next door neighbour who's also 72 and didn't manage to make it. Okay, just a minute to reflect on what I've been saying and we may have time to read that. Okay, starting now, one minute. <laughs> remember more what you said to your neighbour than what I said to you. <laughs> and it's also very good when you're working in a room to do this stop talking. Someone dropped it years ago. But you always pick the most important person in the room. So you pick the chief executive of the hospital and the room loves you. <laughs> so, any, um, any point you'd like to bring up? Take, take, take a couple. Yes? Um, so we talked about trying to maintain uh, both social and intellectual activity in the old so The Surgeon General of the US this year used a huge report on isolation and loneliness. Yeah. Who would ever have thought that? I never thought it. Yes? Anyone else? These chaps who are speaking last? Connectivity. Connectivity, yeah. Holistic. Holistic, yeah. Uh, Holistic and social activity. That's going to say Van Rotten. Bad <laughs> time, yeah, Renaissance. Tina, any other last one for you? Talk about the buddy system. The buddy system. Yeah, with uh, Mike, uh, the goals are what we're doing is building communities. This emerged through XE2, not just the physical activity, we're doing it at the same time. Mike, would you like to say a word about buddy, and then we'll pass on to this. Um, yeah, well, hi. Well, what we found out obviously is it's okay for us that are motivated and want to live life well and grab it, but actually there's an awful lot of factors that say it's not it's not unsensible to be drinking and smoking or whatever in 70 and say I don't want to stop. And I think that's what we we recognise the population is certainly forty percent according to the NHS who are in the category of PM one and two, and that's people that just don't think their health is their business. Um, and we don't think you can tell them it's their business, actually. And we all know from other psychological approaches that asset-based approaches are far more powerful than deficit-based approaches. So telling people to do things when they're older and have limitations, well, the evidence is clear. We've dropped, what, a year and a half's lifespan in the last two decades. So exhortation hasn't worked. We have to get inside people in new ways. So the revolution, go back and tell your mum or dad or grandparents uh, they, they can 